I have to say, as an old newspaper reporter, I have always wanted to be a talk show host. So it's kind of fulfilling my dream today. Uh, we're going to report out from the groups in this session uh, with, with three questions. Uh, the first of which is we're going to ask each of the moderators to tell us uh, a couple of interesting partnerships that they learned about in their sessions. Um, I'm going to start with Chancellor McCormick, both because UMass Dartmouth is my favorite school represented here today, and, um, and uh, I don't want to stop it. The real reason, the real reason is that uh, Chancellor McCormick has another commitment. Now that means the Fall River Herald News is never going to write anything bad about us. Chancellor McCormick. My group was the Marine Science and Technology Group, and we, we had excellent pan, panelists. Mr. Ed Lofgren, who is the owner of 3A Marine, but who has taken on the task of helping to figure out how we're going to produce more marine technicians. We live by the ocean, and we often think about the high-tech jobs of the ocean being scientists, but we also need people to uh, we've sold lots of boats, lots of people are out in the water, and we need to be able to maintain and support them. So Ed added his perspective. Amber Gerald, who's from the National Marine Fisheries, from NOAA, and who is talked to us a lot about scientific needs. Um, Bob Anderson, who's the president of Ocean Server, which is a company that produces underwater vehicles that um, uh, came uh, and, and located in the Advanced Technology and Manufacturing Center where we're trying to help small businesses grow and stay in our region. And John Bullard, who's the president of Sea Education, which is trying to keep students understanding uh, three quarters of the world's surface is ocean. So I would say that in the first question, we're going to do all three questions, Lisa? Yes. Yeah. Uh, we, we had some great partnerships between in preparing um, uh, marine technicians between Bristol Community College and it started at Massasoit and Ed and his folks have been able to expand that because it's not only a local issue but a national issue and um, in talking about the challenges it's the question of how to produce more <coughs> of these people who are prepared in a training program that is not always leading to a degree, but is learning to, leading to skills so that we have this workforce and that we can particularly tap into those people who are in the unemployment statistics that Michael mentioned. So he and his colleagues have a nonprofit group called M, oh, I didn't take one of the brochures, Ed, Edward, if you're out there, could you just give the name? Marine and Environment. With, with the hope to form a center in partnership with institutions and organizations and businesses in the region to be sure we connect this training to the people who would benefit from having the training and be able to stay and live and work in the region. We also talked a lot about the need to produce more kids who are interested in science, which leads to uh, John Bullard talking a lot about the sea semester um, and the desire for us to, you know, have more kids from southeastern Massachusetts be able to participate in that program, maybe through a partnership with our institutions, so that they come away from a away from the land perspective on all the critical issues related to the ocean. I know for the people who participate in that program, it changes their world perspective. So that connects to Ambrose's desire that we need to have more students who pursue the STEM disciplines with enthusiasm. NOAA needs not only people in science, technology, engineering, and math, the biological and natural sciences, but it needs policy makers, it needs people in the social sciences who understand that fisheries has to do with the natural sciences and the fish stock, but also has to do with the ecology of people and the impact of policy and rules. So he's looking to us, has very good partnerships with each of our institutions, but wants to see if we can increase the output 
of those kinds of people. Um, Bob gave us the perspective of a businessman um, saying what is a challenge for them is when a high-tech business is trying to do business and there are rules like the export rules. So you want to have a partnership with China and yet you can't take certain high-tech technologies to, the, to those countries for reasons that have to do with national security. How does he get the expertise to figure out how we can encourage collaboration? Because the, the, the role in the future is less of each individual institution or, or school doing its own thing, or each business, but, but using all of the resources that we have. And what he'd like to see is for us to get our faculty out of the labs and into that intersection with business where problems get solved. And it's an interdisciplinary intersection. We're organized in disciplines, and they're organized around solving problems. And they would like to see us maximize how we do that. Um, I think I might have covered oh, okay. most of those. Does anyone from the group want to add anything that I missed that was really important? We had, a, we had a good conversation with our audience from the Cape Technical Schools who see a real uh, benefit in the Workforce Investment Boards who are very concerned that we do invest our STEM resources wisely. Not always convinced that we have put some money to the STEM program, as David, but maybe we haven't gotten the outcomes that we need. Thanks. Thank you, Chancellor. Uh, anybody else for in interesting partnerships within your group? Uh, we kind of dealt with all three questions at the same time, so I may range okay. across that. But uh, the one partnership that uh, really dates back to 2003-2004 that we talked about was uh, when Cape Wind uh, donated $100,000 to Cape Cod Community College for the development of renewable energy curriculum. Uh, across the board, uh, solar, wind, energy conservation, all, all kinds of renewable energy curriculum, which we did in partnership with local technical high schools, Mass Maritime, and UMass Dartmouth. And that $100,000, along with $35,000 from our county economic development agency, was business and industry and local government investment that allowed us to get a $360,000 National Science Foundation grant that supported that development. So uh, we are already training people in these areas, and we find that there's a little bit of a chicken and egg problem in the sense that there's not a huge number of jobs out there yet, particularly in wind, but we think that will change. Um, we heard also from two other industries where they need partnerships, and the partnerships were flowering as we spoke. I don't know if you want me to mention those now, or you Please. can... Yeah, One, we heard from um, Larry Weldon at Canarca Industries, um, they're working on a new form of, so it's not even accurate to call it solar, it's solar plus any ambient light at all, uh, producing energy, something that will be much more efficient, much less costly than the current solar panels on the roof are now. And they will need people trained for these industries. And we heard um, from Matt Conway, whose uh, business started out uh, doing energy conservation audits and the like, and they moved into uh, solar and hot water uh, installations, uh, the, the kind of on-demand hot water systems that people would like to put in their homes now. Uh, we're not producing enough technicians for this. So we had a developing partnership discussed right at the table with the technical high school in the room, the community college, um, things like classrooms and even laboratory opportunity at the businesses um, as well as at the technical high school so that we are um, planning to a uh, whole, whole class of uh, technicians that are needed that we don't have uh, in this arena. And uh, so those are some exciting partnerships we touched on. Sounds as if, as if you've jumped ahead to the next steps and already that's uh, it's gratifying because I know that's one of the, the, the emphasis in this. Um, or, yeah. 
I do have one. Uh, we talked, of course, about the uh, graduates being hired and interns and the importance of, uh, of the marriage between the health, the service industry and the, and the world of education. But I just quickly wanted to mention one thing uh, for you that Dr. Robert Ross mentioned, and there is a, uh, a Mass Life Science Education Consortium which is fostering the conversations between the healthcare providers and the world of education uh, to provide a consistency of the dialogue. In fact, the consortium is um, going to uh, issue uh, endorsements about the uh, quality of the, some of the programs in the education world. And uh, Robert uh, Ross mentioned that they would be uh, making that announcement December 8th. But it's a good way, I think, to uh, transcend uh, the silos that we sometimes find ourselves in and uh, the much more need to uh, bring our uh, people to the same table. Thank you. Other interesting partnerships? There were two that I think emerged in the information technology applied computers. We were the smallest group by far. Not a surprise looking at the demographic of this room. Um, but I think that the out put from that group was quite dramatic. And of the two things that I wanted to talk about, one was Open Cave, and Kathy um, had asked Dan Gallagher to be here. Unfortunately, he couldn't. But I'll tell you that Open Cave, which is a $40 million development of fiber optic from Brockton, linking all of the Connect schools all the way to P-Town, as has been said earlier this morning, is the game changer. And, and that collaboration started <coughs> with four Cs, and then they went out and they got $32 million in federal grants, $8 million in other grants. And what that will really do is change the way uh, that collaboration will change the way police and fire works, medical services are, are delivered, the information that is shared between medical service providers. All of that requires that high speed optical data transfer that OpenK offers. And on the other end of the spectrum, underwater. Uh, Chris Poloni from USGS was talking about how every summer MATE, which is a, a group of high school students that get together to build um, remote controlled underwater vehicles. And for anybody that spent the summer glued to the TV at the Deepwater Horizon blowout, you saw that technology physically mapping, viewing, measuring, and that's the type of um, STEM application that I think most high school students can get, it, get, get involved in because it involves physics and it involves chemistry and it involves um, instrumentation and remote control and it's in real demand. So those are the two collaborations that I think that we were the most interested in. Thank you. Other interesting partnerships? Just, uh, uh, we, we talked briefly, uh, we did not spend our time talking about partnerships. We, uh, I think we spent more of our time on what we thought were issues um, that we wanted to address. But one of the uh, partnerships that's upcoming uh, that I think is somewhat unique is that at Bridgewater we are developing a $100 million science facility which will be uh, not only a state of the art but to contain some of the brightest science faculty that we've been able to assemble from around the country. And uh, the partnership piece comes in the development of that facility. We are currently in the process of putting together a task force, a community task force, which will be made up of a number of business and industry leaders to really help us to develop a uh, way in which we determine how that facility impacts the region. And from that session will become a strategic plan on how to, how to take this kind of facility and really engage it in the region that will make a difference in terms of uh, not only STEM uh, issues, but business development and economic development. Fabulous, thank you. Dr. Wolf? I do want to say something on this one, that uh, in, in the public service area, we had uh, the, the police chief, New Bedford, Ronald Teachman, and the uh, fire chief of Fall River, Paul Ford, and then the superintendent of schools from New Bedford, uh, Dr. Mary uh, Francis. We have numerous partnerships, uh, so I'm not going to get into the specifics, but there are some partnerships that need to be added to or enhanced that I'm going to leave for uh, the, uh, the recommendation stage. But uh, we, had a, we could have gone on for well over an hour and a half, two hours uh, in the public service one. It was a very engaged discussion, so I have more to say in a minute. <laughs> 
Okay, so we'll move on to trends in the industry. Um, I'm going to ask the panelists if you could just state again, before you state the trends in the industry, exactly what the, the, the topic of the panel is, just in case everybody's memory is as poor as mine is. You may start, certainly. The trends in the industry, uh, the public service area, remember we had public safety, we had uh, you know, pre-K pre, uh, through, through 12. We learned a lot about uh, the, the challenges within particularly the public safety area in terms of uh, residency requirements and civil service issues and on-the-job training. Uh, and the Quinn bill came up, uh, it's, it's back and it's being defunded at the state level. So the context of which we are educating and sending forth our graduates in, in criminal justice and fire science, we learned a lot about that. And this would be reflected in the recommendations um, as well. The, the other thing, of course, the need for professional development in, in the public schools. The, we know that, but, but that came up loud and clear as something that uh, is more needed. Also, assistance with specialists within the schools other than classroom teachers and who need specialized training, such as in speech or an occupational therapy area. So a lot of the context of what's going in on in, in our sectors, we heard very loud and clear. This will be reflected again in what we, we, we put out in the next several weeks. Um, I'd say one of the overriding trends we heard is that the technology uh, that we're looking at in green, uh, green technologies and renewable energy is changing so rapidly that there is a, a, a need for higher ed to be producing students who are flexible and on-the-job learners because what they're learning today in our classrooms will be obsolete in 10 years and they'll have to be retrained and probably on-the-job retrained will have a role to play there as well. But it's that rapid, rapid change uh, is kind of changing the playing field. Um, another trend uh, I just wanted to mention was the need for government to play a role. And we heard from uh, Mary Beth Campbell of the Clean Energy Center specifically to play a role with policy and incentives that will um, assist in business development in these areas and also uh, support the research and development in the senior institutions and curriculum and job training in the community colleges. I'll stop there with those two points. Um, one that hasn't been mentioned before but we gave some discussion to is the lack of diversity in some of the high-tech science and technology sectors and our need to at the uh, lower grade levels be able to attract more um, people of color into these professions since these are the jobs of the future and then we needed to that there is a growing population gap in, in the people who will have access to the high-tech high-paying jobs that Michael mentioned and that this is a critical issue for us particularly in the urban centers in our region. Um, I should mention our uh, health panel um, included uh, uh, Carol Sim, the immediate past president and CEO of Rehabilitation Hospital of the Cape and Islands, uh, Jeffrey Morrill, president and uh, CEO of New Orthro uh, Surgical, uh, Carol Hart, uh, director of human resources at, Mount, at Morton Hospital and Medical Center, and we have uh, Dr. Robert Ross, uh, the senior director for Mass BioTeach. Uh, came in to help, uh, uh, unfortunately, Joan Wood, the senior vice president at Genzyme, uh, couldn't uh, be with us at the last minute. Um, a couple of the challenges in the healthcare field, uh, certainly uh, a constant theme was the need to keep people healthy instead of having them, treating them when they're in the hospitals with a system breakdown. Uh, we need to move more toward uh, preventive uh, activities. Um, with insurers uh, reimbursing individuals, uh, the emphasis is on uh, uh, pre prevention. Uh, <clears throat> leadership development is a critical need uh, and challenge uh, for the uh, healthcare field. Uh, there was some talk about job sharing where faculty uh, practitioners could uh, take some time and come to the institutions uh, to help teach maybe for a semester or two and refresh themselves uh, as well. 
the industry, uh, finally, the industry is, uh, I wanted to point out, consolidating. Uh, but there was, uh, in this brief period that we're in now, and it seems to be coming to more closure of uh, consolidation and acquisitions, um, in 2007, uh, it was pointed out that 14% uh, of the healthcare workforce was imported uh, from international uh, areas. And uh, that's, that's kind of disappeared a little bit in this period of uh, um, activity. But uh, it has been predicted that this will come back again unless we turn out uh, the healthcare providers that are, uh, and service workers that are needed. I want to thank the panel for their great work on this. Thank you. We, uh, we, we uh, did the, we certainly the panel on entrepreneurship and small business. Um, what we know is that 98% of the business in this Commonwealth are, are companies, are organizations of 500 people or less. And many of those are, are as, as small as 20 or less. And so there are significant challenges uh, that they face. Uh, the primary challenge, I think, we would uh, put on the general heading of, of government challenges, which really related to um, health care costs, uh, regulatory uh, challenges that uh, uh, small companies face, uh, the inability to, to have uh, access to government or understanding of government in a way that allows for rapid development of small businesses and sometimes uh, is a discouraging factor. Uh, the other thing we, uh, we saw is a uh, uh, challenge, and there were many, but these are the two that I thought were <clears throat> probably most significant, uh, was the access to capital and the uh, support in terms of kind of educational support uh, for small business, for people who are beginning small businesses who have to run the maze of regulation and, and uh, challenges uh, without the kind of support they need to really understand and make a business successful. Uh, so we, uh, we saw uh, those as, as primarily the, uh, the two major challenges. In applied computers, uh, the challenge is sitting right there in the economic development. There's a chart which talks about the fastest growing occupations in Massachusetts and leading the chart with a 50% increase between now and 2016 <coughs> is network systems, data communications analysts. And that's a challenge because we're not producing the people to fill those jobs. Those jobs will go unfilled or we'll have to import them as Michael so aptly pointed out. So that that's a significant challenge. But there was another one which really involves two other problems that are present in southeastern Massachusetts. One is drinking water slash wastewater. Uh, and the other one is uh, public transportation. And on our panel, we had panelists that talked about each of those with the attendant problems of having people in the employ who understand the monitoring, the, the, the embedded information technology systems. This was a, a nice example. Your coffee pot is no longer just put it on the stove and cook it until it stops perking. There are embedded technology computers in your coffee machine. And we need to have not only the technicians that understand the monitoring and the, uh, the data gathering for wastewater and water treatment and transportation for public systems, we need to understand the people who can fix those systems when they need it. Because if the water system breaks down or the transportation system breaks down, then all of the small businesses that Dana mentioned and all of the things which are critical to our life also break down. So those are two particularly important trends in applied computers. <clears throat> Thank you. So uh, where the, the rubber meets the road on these breakout panels, I guess, next is where um, higher education can assist in these issues. And um, I, I guess next steps would be, would be an integral part of this. I'm going to go first because I'm going to have to leave you because all of our high tech in engineering programs at UMass Dartmouth have national accreditation and right now the national accreditation group is at the university and I have to meet with them at one o'clock so they tell me how great our programs are. <laughs> um, but I, I think I, there were some concrete suggestions of specific projects but I think the message from my panel was keep the doors open, come out of the labs, be in more partnerships, share resources um, in order to address the critical issues that were seen to be the challenges. So I think 
what uh, people were praising what we've already done, but asking us to do more of that and to not, uh, in a time of constraint, sort of close in on ourselves, but to see that the solution really is more working more closely with business, with industry, with schools, with partnerships to ensure that we meet the needs of the region. So my apologies for Thank you, Chancellor. Well, in our healthcare and uh, life science panel, uh, we uh, did identify a few uh, pressing needs. One is uh, to change the cultural bias about math and science. Uh, it's been pointed out that uh, we don't uh, seem to value uh, math and science and so actually discourage uh, uh, young children and people from pursuing their interests. Uh, and uh, that just simply has to change. I, I, I mentioned earlier the international uh, importation that we need to do. Uh, so it seems to be a filter. The culture seems to somehow work to filter out uh, at young ages uh, people from an interest in uh, math and science and uh, certainly want to uh, see whatever we can do to help with that. Uh, another uh, issue, a key issue, is leadership development programs uh, within the healthcare field. Uh, practitioner, both for practitioners uh, so that they are better prepared to move to uh, promotions and new responsibilities uh, within the facility or in the industry, but also uh, in preparing the entering workforce that they need to be, perhaps be broader based in some leadership skills. There was a lot of mention throughout the panel about the so-called soft skills. I hate to use that term because they're very important skills that the employers demand that we have. Um, so uh, cultural bias and uh, leadership programs, IT and, uh, development and informatics is a pressing need. It's not so much down the range, down the uh, long range as short-term needs. Insurers are demanding that uh, certain requirements be met in, uh, in moving to technology and uh, <coughs> by healthcare providers. Uh, and finally, uh, seem to be a, a, a need for more hands-on training in addition to leadership development uh, activities in, uh, within the education world and, and later professional development. Uh, so also there is a need for more hands-on as opposed, I guess, to the theoretical uh, classroom uh, activities that we do. Thank you. I, uh, first, I want to thank our, our panel and our session because there was two, there were a number of recommendations, but two very clear, I think, uh, distinct recommendations that I want to present. Uh, one is to somehow for Connect to provide education for small business startup and for, uh, and for ongoing businesses. Uh, there was some discussion about maybe creating creation of a center that would be a Connect run center, not by one but by the six institutions that would uh, collaborate in finding ways in which we could deliver education and support to small businesses, particularly startup businesses, and I thought that was a great recommendation. Uh, the other was uh, one of the major challenges, as I uh, spoke earlier, was about government uh, interaction, or maybe I want to say intervention, uh, and a recommendation that, uh, that we, the Connect Partners, uh, use and uh, tap into the relationships we have with local government uh, to really facilitate the development of business in those communities, a way in which we would uh, educate uh, cities and towns about the advantage of small business development, uh, help them to look at the planning for businesses in their cities and towns, uh, because many of the uh, startups are running into challenges in, in local cities and towns that have just uh, really have not allowed them to develop in ways that they need to. So I thought those two recommendations were very good, very clear uh, recommendations. Okay. And we had two in information technology and computer applications. The, the first for higher ed, for the Connect institutions, was cross training. We tend in higher ed to operate in silos where we learn things more and more about less and less until we know everything there is to know about something that nobody cares about. <laughs> and, and in our panel, it was obvious that in business, that's not what you want. You want a cross-trained employee, ambidextrous employee, 
Um, it isn't just IT, but it is a wider amalgam of engineering, oceanography, medical data, monitoring devices, instrumentation and control, composite materials, electronics, computers, and communications, and the ability to operate handheld PDAs. So all of that is truly the employee that business wants, and it's incumbent on us to make sure that our graduates have all those skills, or similar sets of skills. And then the second one I really loved, and it was we need to expand our experiential learning opportunities, and not just in business systems, but in contract managers, project managers, mechanics, all of those systems that are important to the small businesses. And we've heard it said a couple of ways already this morning, get out of the classroom, get out of the laboratory, get into the business and see how it really works. And nothing is more important for a student than to get out of the classroom and go into the real world and find out that what they're learning really has applied value. Anybody who's got school-age kids hears this all the time. What do I need this for? I'm never going to use this. And when they get out into the real world, they find out they use it all the time. So those two. And then there was one that was totally off the wall, a certificate for HR people. We have increasing number of employees, and we need professionals who need how to manage those employees. And community colleges and, and um, higher education institutions could offer a four or six course sequence in HR um, training for the trainers of the people who end up being our employees. Thank you. Next steps. Um, we had a very specific recommendation to have a um, call together, not really a, a summit so much as a working session uh, with the industries who are developing renewable energy and other green technologies. Uh, the colleges of, and universities of Connect, and the technical high schools to just really roll up our sleeves and start to develop the curriculum and the planning around space and location and recruiting the students and so forth. So some similar meeting to this, but focused specifically on green technologies, renewable energy, and um, the curriculum and training programs that we need, like yesterday, uh, in the case of some of the folks that were in the room with us. Um, there was also, and I, I'm going to call this kind of what I heard in a variety of different ways. I wouldn't say it was a specific recommendation, but I heard the frustration of business leaders with what I call the alphabet soup of agencies, uh, kind of don't know where to go between the local economic development agencies, the workforce investment boards, the state agencies, the county agencies, um, all of whom have a mission to support business development, but Sometimes businesses don't know who to go to for what, when. So if we can figure out a communication plan uh, to better inform business about who to go to for what, uh, both regionally and at the state level, that would be really good. Um, I also heard, this wasn't out of our session, but I heard uh, Hall talk about it, uh, that maybe more important in a region like mine where we're isolated from the, from the mainland, but the idea of cross enrollments cross-registration among our six institutions. We've tried to get out the message that um, Connect is an organization where if you call one of us, you get all of us. And that's certainly true in the arena of economic development, business development, workforce development. Um, but taking that to the nth degree would mean students from my institution could pick up courses at Bridgewater or at Massasoit or, or um, and I will say that the Connect CEOs have touched on this issue, and uh, I think we will continue to talk about a way to do that. Our group, the Public Safety Group, was very specific. They would like the uh, Connect institutions to do more with the civic engagement of our students, service learning, volunteering, uh, after school youth programs, working more with uh, both the schools and, and the police and the fire. It's something we do, but we heard very loud and clear they would like us to do more with civic engagement and service learning, so it's a clear message. Also, uh, both the public safety and the school group uh, would like our help in leveraging more grant money, leveraging additional funds, and certainly we, we can do that. We can use our grant, our grants expertise in working with the school system, the public safety area, 
to, to file uh, uh, more grant applications and uh, to get additional funding. Undergirding, of course, all of this is the fact that uh, sustainable, predictable funding of public safety and public education is crucial, so I'm not making that point, right? Um, the, uh, the final thing is, it really is two parts, and I'll be quick, but the, the, the police sector would like our help in raising the bar for entry qualifications uh, to become an officer in our various police departments in the Commonwealth. Right now, it requires a high school diploma, GED, or three years of military service, and there's interest in raising that bar to associate degree or bachelor's degree. But beyond that, and that's something we will, of course, uh, discuss, beyond that, the idea of tailoring professional development uh, experiences more to where the career person is at that point in his or her career. Example being in a fire department. If somebody's been in the fire department for 20 years, they may need something different than somebody who's being educated and trained to get into a fire department. I think we do that, but we heard the need to do even more of that. So some very specific recommendations. The one that I heard very loudly was do more with service learning. Thank you. I think more than enough to keep everybody busy for the foreseeable future. Mm -hmm. uh, I want to acknowledge Senator Mark Pacheco just joined us. Uh, congratulations. There you go. Congratulations. <laughs> Kevin, do we have time for questions from, from the audience? About 15 minutes? And then we'll stop standing between you and lunch. Anybody? <laughs> Yes. My question is related to the fact that Massachusetts, um, in its terms of its um, elementary, is based upon passing MCAS. And MCAS is pretty much straightforward. We talked about oh, in our group, um, the fact that the vocational and some of the technical and some of the other needs aren't addressed through the MCAS test system. How is that being addressed in terms of institutions of higher learning? And is that something that maybe we can report back to? Policymakers that maybe we need to kind of, if we're going to be competitive not only locally but globally, um, how do we have the best of both worlds? Thank you. More question maybe for community colleges? Maybe, maybe Dana, what, what this question makes me think of is race at the top. And race at the top in a way is going to transition us from MCAS and a high school completion focus to a college going rate focus. And Dana can probably tell us more about how that's going to work at the state level. Well, I think Kathy's exactly right. And I think that's what Race to the Top is going to do because we're beginning to understand that MCAS is not a great predictor. I will uh, tell you a, a little story. I was visited by a Chinese delegation uh, this will help you understand your case. A Chinese delegation a couple of years ago, and I was serving at that time as the uh, president of the governor's advisor on education. And uh, they didn't want to uh, obviously embarrass me or insult us, so they asked the question very kindly. And what he said was, so you telling me that you give your students in the 10th grade a test based on eighth grade knowledge to graduate from the 12th grade. And I said, yeah, that's what we do. <laughs> so I think we've come to understand that MCAS is really not the great predictor. And I think Kathy's right. Uh, race to the top, I think, is going to transition us over time away from that kind of testing to really looking at how we literally prepare students to be uh, college-going uh, students and, and not really to screen them out by testing, but do better preparation so that all of our students are prepared. Thank you. Are there other questions? Oh, I'm sorry, please. I would be interested in knowing for each of the panelists, um, what is the one thing that they think would be most important for the Connect organization to accomplish between today and the next meeting that we have here a year from now? I think he's pinning you down. <laughs> No, she handed it to me. <laughs> where's where's uh, Jean when we need her? Uh, I think the most the most important thing we can do is to is to follow up 
first of all, on the proceedings of today, to, to everyone who's in attendance. Secondly, to, to look at the recommendations and amongst us, see which ones we can deliver on uh, during this next coming year. Because one of the hallmarks of the Connect uh, uh, partnership is that we want to, to deliver on what the region tells us that it needs. So uh, I think, and mine's a process answer, but that's the best answer I can come up with right now. Um, I would say this convening business and the institutions together to develop the curriculum we need for the jobs that are going to be there that will really help our uh, region grow jobs, but we need to develop the training programs. And what we heard about renewable energy and green technologies I imagine would be repeated in every one of the other panels where new jobs are emerging. We need to uh, be nimble and fast about developing the curriculum and we need both input uh, from business to know that we're really creating what's needed and also their support in terms of internship placements, space to run classes, um, opportunity to develop their own workforce maybe, to hire level jobs, all kinds of um, partnerships emerge from this. So I'd say that's the most important thing I heard. I would add that as well. Actually, the question should be turned around. Though One of the purposes of the summit is to hear from the community of what, how we can uh, and connect can uh, serve you, and that is to embed ourselves. So the first purpose is to embed <coughs> ourselves in the community throughout the region to be sure that we're satisfying the needs that you have. Uh, and from a more parochial standpoint, I think I would urge, uh, I would like to see uh, community leaders uh, advocate and champion for uh, public higher education in our region, uh, the support that we need to provide those wonderful activities that you, that you need and that you want. Uh, and we need to get the, uh, get the attention of uh, everyone about the importance of Connect, the importance of public higher education. I, uh, I guess I would answer that uh, by saying that uh, if there's uh, anything we need to do between now and the next time we meet uh, next year at this time is to, uh, is to take what we've learned today, to understand what we've learned today, to take the recommendations in their entirety and for Connect to use that information to develop a strategy for engagement and to share that strategy back with this community so that we are clear about what the relationship uh, is and where we're going and how in fact we are going to be effective as an organization uh, with this community. For me, the challenge is advocacy, and Jack touched on it. Uh, in this state, we do not value public higher education. We invest a ton of money in K-12, and then it falls off the cliff, and we don't encourage public higher education. And yet, 66% of the students who graduate from our high schools who go on to higher education go to public higher education, and 75% of those stay in Massachusetts. And we don't advocate. When the Boston Globe can do an absolute terrible tar and feathering of random public higher education with no facts on Sunday, that is a mistake, particularly when my youngest son goes to UMass Amherst, and I was at his dorm room, and there was this big, giant poster on the side. And I said, did you see this? He said, no. I said, well, you need to, because according to a number of magazines that measure value, not, not price, not um, the US News and World Report analysis, but value, how much is this education going to mean for you? What was the price ratio to value? And it was UMass Amherst happened to beat Harvard and Yale in two magazines' analysis of value of the education, what you paid for it and what you got for it. And we don't, and public higher education is an incredible value. We don't sell it in our state very well. We're the redheaded stepchildren of higher education. It's not, it's not right. So for me, it's advocacy. Mass State Appropriation for Public Higher Ed 
is down about 37% in the last two years, from 08 to 10, according to the chart. Down 37%. Is there a strategy, or how do we plan to develop a strategy to address that, to reverse that? Ask the legislator. <laughs> <laughs> this might be better to send The 37% uh, figure is a little bit misleading uh, because the state filled in with arrow money, the federal stimulus money, uh, that we, we still suffered uh, losses, but not that severe. What we're all really worried about is the next fiscal year where we don't see that the state has the capacity to replace all of that federal stimulus money. And um, I would say it's a policy question for the state how, how it plans to support public higher education. Thank you. Other questions? Yes. A recent uh, Department of Labor study talked about uh, the need to develop middle skilled people. Education and training for technicians, essentially. What will we do in this area to achieve this? We talked a little bit about that with regard to the fire department. Would you like to take this one? Well, I, I think. Uh, that's on all our minds, um, working on programs like that, whether it's in the environmental or the marine area or the applied computer technology or the green area. A lot of what the colleges do, uh, and it's not you know, thinking principally here of the community colleges, but uh, all institutions, we do a lot of this kind of work in the non-credit area right now. It's a little bit under the radar screen, to use that jargon, but we are doing that, and I think we need to work more closely with the, with the various industries and public service entities to do more of that and to tailor more of that. Uh, a good example from the session that, that I moderated in the public service was the needs of fire departments for, for mid-level technical training. You know, not, not, not history 101 or 102, because I'm a historian so I can say that, um, they need that too, by the way, but, but in, in mid-career, you need certain focus on chemicals and, and dealing with chemicals and biologicals and, and, and new ways of putting out fires. And uh, so I think we're doing that. I think that the way to keep doing that is to keep dialoguing with the industry, such as, in your case, the Mass Marine Trades Association. Thank you. We might have time for one more question, if there is one. Okay, well I think the panel absolutely deserves a round of applause.